merchant, seeking goodly pearls, and having found one pearl of great price, he went out and sold everything he possessed, that he might be able to buy the extraordinary pearl. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a sweep net, which was cast into the sea, and it gathered up every kind of fish. Now when the net was filled, the fishermen drew it up on the beach, where they sat down and sorted out the fish, gathering the good into vessels, while the bad they threw away. Many other parables spoke Jesus to the multitudes. In fact, from this time forward, he seldom taught the masses except by this means. After speaking to a public audience in parables, he would, during the evening classes, more fully and explicitly expound his teachings to the apostles and the evangelists. 5. The Visit to Caressa The multitude continued to increase throughout the week. On Sabbath, Jesus hastened away to the hills, but when Sunday morning came, the crowds returned. Jesus spoke to them in the early afternoon, after the preaching of Peter, and when he had finished, he said to his apostles, I am weary of the throngs. Let us cross over to the other side, that we may rest for a day. On the way across the lake, they encountered one of those violent and sudden windstorms which are characteristic of the Sea of Galilee, especially at this season of the year. This body of water is almost 700 feet below the level of the sea, and is surrounded by high banks, especially on the west. There are steep gorges leading up from the lake into the hills, and as the heated air rises in a pocket over the lake during the day, there is a tendency after sunset for the cooling air of the gorges to rush down upon the lake. These gales come on quickly, and sometimes go away just as suddenly. It was just such an evening gale that caught the boat carrying Jesus over to the other side on this Sunday evening. Three other boats containing some of the younger evangelists were trailing after. This tempest was severe, notwithstanding that it was confined to this region of the lake, there being no evidence of a storm on the western shore. The wind was so strong that the waves began to wash over the boat. The high wind had torn the sail away before the apostles could furl it, and they were now entirely dependent on their oars as they laboriously pulled for the shore a little more than a mile and a half distant. Meanwhile, Jesus lay asleep in the stern of the boat under a small overhead shelter. The master was weary when they left Bethsaida, and it was to secure rest that he had directed them to sail him across to the other side. These ex-fishermen were strong and experienced oarsmen, but this was one of the worst gales they had ever encountered. Although the wind and the waves tossed their boat about as though it were a toy ship, Jesus slumbered on, undisturbed. Peter was at the right-hand oar near the stern. When the boat began to fill with water, he dropped his oar and, rushing over to Jesus, shook him vigorously in order to awaken him. And when he was aroused, Peter said, Master, don't you know we are in a violent storm? If you do not save us, we will all perish. As Jesus came out in the rain, he looked first at Peter, and then peering into the darkness at the struggling oarsman, he turned his glance back upon Simon Peter, who in his agitation had not yet returned to his oar, and said, Why are all of you so filled with fear? Where is your faith? Peace, be quiet. Jesus had hardly uttered this rebuke to Peter and the other apostles. He had hardly bidden Peter seek peace wherewith to quiet his troubled soul, when the disturbed atmosphere, having established its equilibrium, settled down into a great calm. The angry waves almost immediately subsided, while the dark clouds, having spent themselves in a short shower, vanished, and the stars of heaven shone overhead. All this was purely coincidental, as far as we can judge, but the apostles, particularly Simon Peter, never ceased to regard the episode as a nature miracle. It was especially easy for the men of that day to believe in nature miracles inasmuch as they firmly believed that all nature was a phenomenon directly under the control of spirit forces and supernatural beings. Jesus plainly explained to the twelve that he had spoken to their troubled spirits and had addressed himself to their fear-tossed minds that he had not commanded the elements to obey his word, but it was of no avail. The Master's followers always persisted in placing their own interpretation on all such coincidental occurrences. From this day on, they insisted on regarding the Master as having absolute power over the natural elements. Peter never grew weary of reciting how even the winds and the waves obey him. It was late in the evening when Jesus and his associates reached the shore, and since it was a calm and beautiful night, they all rested in the boats, not going ashore until shortly after sunrise the next morning. When they were gathered together, about forty in all, Jesus said, 
Let us go up into yonder hills and tarry for a few days, while we ponder over the problems of the Father's kingdom. 6. The Caressa Lunatic Although most of the nearby eastern shore of the lake sloped up gently to the highlands beyond, at this particular spot there was a steep hillside, the shore in some places dropping sheer down into the lake. Pointing up to the side of the nearby hill, Jesus said, Let us go up on this hillside for our breakfast, and under some of the shelters rest and talk. This entire hillside was covered with caverns which had been hewn out of the rock. Many of these niches were ancient sepulchres. About halfway up the hillside, on a small, relatively level spot, was the cemetery of the little village of Carissa. As Jesus and his associates passed near this burial ground, a lunatic, who lived in these hillside caverns, rushed up to them. This demented man was well known about these parts, having one time been bound with fetters and chains, and confined in one of the grottoes. Long since he had broken his shackles, and now roamed at will among the tombs and abandoned sepulchres. This man, whose name was Amos, was afflicted with a periodic form of insanity. There were considerable spells when he would find some clothing and deport himself fairly well among his fellows. During one of these lucid intervals he had gone over to Bethsaida, where he heard the preaching of Jesus and the apostles, and at that time had become a half-hearted believer in the gospel of the kingdom. But soon a stormy phase of his trouble appeared, and he fled to the tombs where he moaned, cried out aloud, and so conducted himself as to terrorize all who chanced to meet him. When Amos recognized Jesus, he fell down at his feet and exclaimed, I know you, Jesus, but I am possessed of many devils, and I beseech that you will not torment me. This man truly believed that his periodic mental affliction was due to the fact that, at such times, evil or unclean spirits entered into him and dominated his mind and body. His troubles were mostly emotional. His brain was not grossly diseased. Jesus, looking down upon the man crouching like an animal at his feet, reached down and, taking him by the hand, stood him up and said to him, Amos, you are not possessed of a devil. You have already heard the good news that you are a son of God. I command you to come out of this spell. And when Amos heard Jesus speak these words, there occurred such a transformation in his intellect that he was immediately restored to his right mind and the normal control of his emotions. By this time a considerable crowd had assembled from the nearby village, and these people, augmented by the swine herders from the highland above them, were astonished to see the lunatic sitting with Jesus and his followers, in possession of his right mind, and freely conversing with them. As the swine herders rushed into the village to spread the news of the taming of the lunatic, the dogs charged upon a small and untended herd of about thirty swine, and drove most of them over a precipice into the sea. And it was this incidental occurrence, in connection with the presence of Jesus and the supposed miraculous curing of the lunatic, that gave origin to the legend that Jesus had cured Amos by casting a legion of devils out of him, and that these devils had entered into the herd of swine, causing them forthwith to rush headlong to their destruction in the sea below. Before the day was over, this episode was published abroad by the swine tenders, and the whole village believed it. Amos most certainly believed this story. He saw the swine tumbling over the brow of the hill shortly after his troubled mind had quieted down, and he always believed that they carried with them the very evil spirits which had so long tormented and afflicted him. And this had a good deal to do with the permanency of his cure. It is equally true that all of Jesus' apostles, save Thomas, believed that the episode of the swine was directly connected with the cure of Amos. Jesus did not obtain the rest he was looking for. Most of that day he was thronged by those who came in response to the word that Amos had been cured, and who were attracted by the story that the demons had gone out of the lunatic into the herd of swine. And so, after only one night of rest, early Tuesday morning, Jesus and his friends were awakened by a delegation of these swine-raising Gentiles, who had come to urge that he depart from their midst. Said their spokesman to Peter and Andrew, Fishermen of Galilee, depart from us, and take your prophet with you. We know he is a holy man, but the gods of our country do not know him, and we stand in danger of losing many swine. The fear of you has descended upon us, so that we pray you to go hence. And when Jesus heard them, he said to Andrew, Let us return to our place. As they were about to depart, Amos besought Jesus to permit him to go back with them, but the master would not consent. Said Jesus to Amos, 
Forget not that you are a son of God. Return to your own people and show them what great things God has done for you. And Amos went about publishing that Jesus had cast a legion of devils out of his troubled soul, and that these evil spirits had entered into a herd of swine, driving them to quick destruction. And he did not stop until he had gone into all the cities of the Decapolis, declaring what great things Jesus had done for him.